From the far reaches of the Milky Way galaxy, it's Retro Nerd Girl with a film review for you. Today, I'll be reviewing the movie Wizards, released in 1977. Starring Bob Holt, Jesse Wells, and Richard Romanus. Directed by Ralph Bakshi. The synopsis is, on a post-apocalyptic Earth, a wizard and his comrades fight against his twin brother, who is an evil wizard using Nazi propaganda to rule the planet. This film is the brainchild of revolutionary American director of animated and live-action films and television projects, Ralph Bakshi. He worked in the business as an animator and director from 1956 until the late 1990s. Some of his most notable work was on four episodes of Mighty Heroes TV series in 1966 and 25 episodes of the Spider-Man TV series in 1970. After that, he blew the minds of audiences with his debut feature animated film of an adult-oriented theme, Fritz the Cat, in 1972, which had an X rating. He followed it up with Heavy Traffic in 1973 and Coonskin in 1974, which were both equally controversial for mainstream audiences. These films were mostly about urban life with a social commentary, but his next project would be fantasy-based, which was a little surprising to his growing fan base. The concept began as an idea that Ralph was working on for an unproduced television series that he pitched to CBS in 1967, based on fantasy drawings that he created in high school. Nine years later, he pitched it as a quote-unquote family picture called War Wizards to 20th Century Fox, about the same time that George Lucas was pitching Star Wars. They both got the green light to make their films. George received $11 million to make his film. Ralph received $1.2 million for War Wizards. The story begins with an uncredited narration from Susan Tyrell, famous for playing in the cult classic movie Forbidden Zone in 1979. I know that exposition is a storytelling feature that many people do not enjoy, but I just gobble it up like pie. <laughs> See, to me, it brings a deep sense of history and lore, which I thought was well used in this film, similar to a child listening to a well-read bedtime story. Susan's voice in particular was a special feature, fleshing out the lore with a sense of gravity and drama. I loved it so very much. So to catch up on the details, I'm just going to set up the story for you, and there's a lot of story to cover. The narrator begins the story as, quote, an illuminating history bearing on the everlasting struggle for world supremacy fought between the powers of technology and magic, unquote. Immediately, you may get the notion that the story is placing an emphasis on the theory that technology is bad and magic that's replacing the word nature is good. So it's a battle between nature and technology. And indeed, it seems so as we learn that the Earth has been destroyed in a thousand atomic fireballs. Only a handful of humans survived. The rest changed into hideous mutants who were left in radioactive lands that never allowed them to become human again. Two million years later, the Earth began to heal and fairies, elves, dwarves returned to the restored lands. One of those lands is Montagar, ruled by the queen of the fairies, Delia. After 3,000 years of peace, she gave birth to a pair of baby wizard twins. Black Wolf was the evil one, and Avatar is the good wizard. It's the classic good versus evil story. So far, so good. I love the idea of opposing twins and the magical elements going on in the story. They don't look 
anything alike, and I suppose that they are fraternal twins. Black Wolf, in particular, has a very unique design. He has non-human bones for arms. I don't know what bones they are, but they're not human. But very cool. I, I, I like the design. When Delia died somewhere between 7,000 and 10,000 years later, Black Wolf fought Avatar for power, but lost vowing to return. 3,000 years later, after gathering up an army of mutants, Black Wolf waged war every now and then, but his armies never won, because in the middle of fighting, many of them would just forget why they were fighting and abandon the battle. Oh, just at his wit's end, Black Wolf begins to hatch this master plan, and it's actually quite effective. First, he sends out robots to assassinate many of the world's leaders of elves and fairies and dwarves, which leaves them ununified. He strikes again, but this time his army is completely brainwashed with Nazi propaganda films of Earth's ancient past and uses a projector to project the propaganda into the skies on the field of battle to scare away the enemy. The concept is pretty good with room for lots of opportunities to build up more lore and expand the world. This part of the story is all done with broad strokes, but then the story narrows down to follow a small band of heroes. Necron 99 is a robot who is instructed to kill the world's president. He is very successful in doing so, but he gets captured by Avatar. Avatar reprograms him with magic and changes his name to Peace, helping the wizard the president's daughter, Eleanor, and an elven warrior, Weehawk, to get to Black Wolf Stronghold, Scorch One. Our hero in the film, Avatar, is not a typical hero. In fact, he rejects his title all the way through the film and wants to avoid conflict of any kind. He even says, wake me up when the earth is destroyed. <laughs> he only faces his brother when he sees no other choice to save the world. For the voice of Avatar, Bakshi cast Bob Holt because he liked his impression of one of Bakshi's favorite actors, Peter Falk. Bob does that impression throughout the film as he played Avatar but managed to change it just enough that it was more endearing than comical. And I think that was because Avatar is supposed to be a lovable older hippie that has more of a carefree attitude about life to oppose his brother who is restless, domineering, and warmongering. The film is definitely into showing us the extremes of both sides. Extremely evil, extremely good. Now, Avatar gets a love interest in the form of Eleanor, a highly sexualized young princess training to be a fairy. It's a little jarring because she, it's kind of expected that she's going to fall for the young elven warrior. However, the film does mention the age difference quite a few times during the course of the story. Or rather, Avatar says something about how old he is compared to Eleanor every now and then. Eleanor brings a lighter tone to the film, and I actually appreciated the character. By the way, Princess Eleanor was named after Ralph Bakshi's first girlfriend. Weehawk is a warrior and a leader of his village, and besides being a great fighter, he's also incredibly brave. And at some points in the film, he acts as the hero archetype, although he's only a supporting character. Peace, or Necron 99, was featured on the poster riding his two-legged horse. So I thought he was going to be a major character, but he isn't. In fact, we do spend a good chunk of time just watching him travel. And I love those moments as we get to see the sprawling visuals of this post-apocalyptic world. He was the one character I wish we had a bit more time with in the story. Visually, he's interesting. We bond with him a bit, and he even makes a swift transformation. But unfortunately, he's out of the film by the last third. Bakshi's idea for creating Necron 99 came from and was heavily influenced by his friend, underground comic artist Ron Bode's apocalyptic character Cobalt 60. 
In fact, looking at Vaughn's work, you can see a lot of his influence in this film. The visuals in this film is where the film really receives its greatest deal of praise and criticism. The inconsistency of animation is the reason why. A great deal of that was Ralph Bakshi's natural inclination to experiment on screen with his films. And for me, this is the joy of watching his work. He toyed with different styles of hand-drawn animations with characters. Some images weren't animated at all. They were just drawings zoomed in for drama. There were still images sliding across the screen to animate the scene with very little difficulty. Most of these things anybody can do on their computer today with ease. Because the budget was so squeezed, there were so many corners that had to be cut. For instance, the horse-like animals that had two feet instead of four was because it was easier and cheaper to animate. These creatures actually went on to inspire the Tauntauns in Empire Strikes Back, released in 1980. The art in the film ranged from kitty light-hearted, line-drawn cartoon characters to intense beasts. None of them seemed to match the dark, brooding background of the post-apocalypse. And I believe that they were meant to clash with the characters, to stand out and be noticed as if to say, this is what the Earth could look like if mankind doesn't pay attention and heed the story's warning. There's even a point in the film where Avatar calls out the environment for its doom and gloom and magically conjures up flowers to brighten up the scene. And I love that this film is actually self-aware. The film uses a lot of rotoscoping for live action actors and live action stock footage as well to create Black Wolf's army and action sequences from movies like Alexander Nevsky, released in 1938, El Cid, released in 1961, Zulu, released in 1964, Battle of the Bulge, released in 1965, and Patton, released in 1970. Much of the footage was repeated as well to stretch out the pacing of the battle. Some of it worked and some of it was kind of hard to make out. And I think that this was because it was done so quickly and did not have the budget behind it to smooth out a lot of the edges. The studio declined Bakshi's request for salary increases and $5,000 to complete the battle sequence in the film. So he funded what he could himself and rotoscoping the battle sequences was his best solutions to do that. He said... Quote unquote, I thought that if we dropped all the detail, it would look very artistic and very beautiful. And also said, I'm looking for a way to get realism into my film and get real emotion. It also was the way that showed me how to do Lord of the Rings. And Lord of the Rings was released a year later, in which he used quite a lot of rotoscoping. On top of that, there was the live action film that was actually placed in the background of the cartoon animation. And this to me was definitely a Bakshi fingerprint. Although Cool World released in 1992 got a lot of grief for trying to be a copy of Roger Rabbit, Bakshi was trying to do this much before and this kind of experimentation is the kind of thing that helps push film technology forward. The music was another fascinating element that lends to the tone of the film, which was done by Andrew Belling. It was magical with an old world sound using lovely flutes and guitar. Then at a moment's notice, there was a crescendo of sounds clashing together to depict the sounds of war with psychedelic electric guitars and organs. It set the mood wonderfully. Close to the release of the movie, George Lucas kindly requested that Bakshi drop the war part of the title of his film to avoid confusion with Star Wars. Bakshi agreed to change the title of the film from War Wizards to Wizards. It was also agreed that Mark Hamill, who wanted more work in the industry, would take time off from Star Wars to record his voice for a small character in Wizards. 
His voice matched the character, but it was hardly how we know his voice to be today. Although you may ask around, have you seen Wizards? You may get a lot of shrugged shoulders, but for a film that costs only $1.2 million, it made over $9 million at the box office. That's a good profit. And in 1977, that was an incredible profit. Bakshi said that he intended Wizards to be seen as a trilogy. One of the sequels elaborated on the relationship between Avatar, Eleanor, and Weehawk. And let's just say that Weehawk kind of gets in the way. <laughs> the film never came about, but even as late as 2015, Bakshi teased that he had a script finished. I only really learned about this film while doing research for one of Bakshi's other films, Fire and Ice, released in 1983. I was really surprised that I hadn't heard of it, and I was indeed very glad to have the opportunity to actually see it. I feel that the film is definitely a warning to the audience about the influence of propaganda and how it was used in the past in our own history, and how it may possibly be used in our present day. We just don't know it. Within the story, there's also a commentary about organized religion, the apathy of death during times of war, and the possible doom of history repeating itself. It's very anti-war, and this is very easy to see this message when we understand that America was only two years post the Vietnam War. This message, along with Bakshi's unique visual techniques, resulted in a pulsating, psychedelic swirl of war and gore. Even though this is quite a heavy tone and the film is quite intense in many areas, it does take a few scenes to insert some levity and comedy. There's actually a famously funny scene referred to as They Killed Fritz, which is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> this film and many of Ralph Bakshi's works are considered precursors to MTV's Liquid Television and Cartoon Network's Adult Swim. In particular, it is said to have directly influenced the television show Adventure Time, released in 2010. The ending is also one of those comedic moments that take you by surprise. It's a lot like that moment in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark when Indy shoots a swordsman preparing for an epic sword fight. Avatar doesn't duel it out with Black Wolf with magic, but he simply shoots him with a gun. He uses technology. <laughs> he uses technology, the very thing that the film says is bad. The argument of technology being evil is not one of the more refined arguments in the film because even though Black Wolf uses an ancient projector, tanks, and guns, Avatar uses a robot as his guide, conjures up a jukebox at one time during the film, and uses a gun to vanquish his enemy. So the message is, if I'm interpreting this correctly, not that technology is bad, but it's how you use it. And sometimes you use it because you have to. <laughs> Again, that's my interpretation of the message. Uh, please share your take on this in the comments. There are so many things themes and messages in the film from the mind of Bakshi. It may not be quite suitable for kids as Bakshi originally intended, but it was a big hit among young adults in the 1970s. In many cases, the wild visuals added to the experience if some of the audience members were dabbling with um, certain substances. <laughs> Now, in my opinion, this is definitely an art film, experimenting with mixing different styles of animation and mediums of film in a way that fascinates me. I love when artists try different techniques, and maybe it's not flawlessly executed on screen, but I feel like Bakshi was really playing with all of this and just having fun with it too. And he even got to explore a lot of this in more of his later movies. 
Not every image works for everyone, but I enjoyed it a lot because no matter what Ralph Bakshi did creatively and what it ended up looking like, it was still tied to his unique storytelling. My rating is a 6.8. Well, that sums up my review. I hope you liked it. And if you did, I have over 120 of these videos. So go on and browse the channel and see more reviews from me like this. Subscribe if you haven't done so already and hit the bell icon to be the very first to be notified of my next video. This is Retro Nerd Girl signing off. Take care, movie lovers. I'm off to my next review.